Welcome back, everyone. I'm Sarah James, Associate Podcast Producer here at Byte. And I'm Stuart Elmore, Director and President of Cardinal Film Fights. Today, we are happy to announce a partnership between Byte and Cardinal Film Fights, wherein we will be working on future projects and hosting different content. This essentially means you will be able to see our fights here on the Byte channel and seeing some of our fighters come over to anchor the episodes you already love. We will be posting one fight a week leading up to a title fight between Byte, Cardinal Film Fights, and Real Deal, airing the second week of May. So, without further delay, let's get right into this week's fight. Hey everybody, welcome to our next episode of Cardinal Film Fights. Thank you all for joining us. I am back as judging, thank the Lord. And uh, we have three awesome fighters next to us. Let's just get right to it. On my left, we have Sarah. Hi guys, I'm Sarah James. I am a junior TCOM video production and creative writing double major here at Ball State. Uh, this is my first time fighting for Cardinal Film Fights and I'm really excited about it. Awesome, good intro. And then we have Eamon. Hey there, I'm Eamon. I'm a freshman TCOM and theatrical studies double major. Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Cool. And we have Nick. Yeah, uh, I'm Nicholas Rohrman, and ditto. Awesome. <laughs> sweet. Fun fact, he's also my roommate. Yeah. So. Oh, really? Oh, hey. That's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Well, sweet. Well, let's just get right to it, guys. Uh, of course, we got Vaughn fact checking and Morgan on time and score. And uh, you guys all got the questions ahead of time. You all good on the rules right now? Yes. yes sir. All right. And you also know the last round is double points, right? Mm. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. And it's going to be a random order. So our first question is, Best pilot episode. Now we're going to start with the one minute intro with Sarah going this way. So Sarah, whenever you're ready, the clock will start. So I went with the longest running fantasy show in North America, which is Supernatural. The show is currently on its 12th season and over the years has built up an insane number of fans who love and support Sam and Dean Winchester. This fan base is massive and the pilot episode is something that is still talked about and seen as important 12 years later. It sets up the characters in the world so beautifully, has amazing quotes that fans still talk about, such as, driver picks the music, shotgun shuts his cake hole, dad's on a hunting trip and hasn't been home in a few days, and one of my personal favorites, we've got work to do. I mean, that line was utilized in the show's 200th episode, and it comes from the pilot. The pilot establishes the most important relationship for the entire show, which is the bond between these two brothers. That relationship has been the driving force behind the show for 12 years, and it's the reason fans are still watching even now for season 12. And we get that dynamic between Sam and Dean right off the bat. Awesome. Really good intro. Thank All right. You. And Eamon, you're up next whenever okay. you're ready. Uh, my uh, best pilot episode was Rick and Morty. Um, Rick and Morty, the, the pilot episode sets the tone of the entire series perfectly. But one thing that uh, the Rick and Morty pilot does that a lot of shows, uh, unfortunately, fall to is it's not an exposition episode. We get a lot of uh, serialized shows um, that take the first episode to try and explain everything. Rick and Morty jumps right into the action and uh, takes a little bit of time to explain the world in which they live and the world which they and the many universes they uh, travel to. But other than that, it uh, hits the ground running, sets you off on a fantastic adventure, and uh, sets the uh, tone perfectly for the rest of the series. Awesome. Cool. All right. And uh, last got Nick. All right. Uh, I chose Futurama and Futurama is just amazing in general. And I think the thing that makes uh, Futurama so great is, um, sorry, wait. <laughs> um, it's, it just sets it up so perfectly. And like he said, it, it is an extremely exposition heavy episode, but at the same time, it still gets into the action. And I think the best thing about Futurama is it is such an intricate, it, I don't even know what I'm saying, such an intricate story and heavily detailed, yet all of it is immediately aware in the first episode. And I think that's something that Matt Groening and everyone behind Futurama really should be proud of. Awesome. Really cool. Good introductions, guys. And let's go ahead and start on our five-minute open forum. Okay, so I'm going after you first. I don't think your pilot happens without his pilot. So really, it's just an argument between the two of us. Agreed. So, but beyond that, like, <laughs> I don't, I'm not a big um, adult cartoon person. That's not my sense of humor. So uh, when I watched both of these pilots over the weekend, like, I really didn't like the Rick and Morty pilot. It's just not, that's not my thing. I was like, I feel uncomfortable and weird <laughs> while watching this. The animation style isn't quite my favorite. Um, and I actually asked one of my best friends who, he watches Rick and Morty and enjoys the show, and I asked him, how does the pilot episode hold up against the rest of the season? And he said, and I quote, 
The pilot, is, the pilot establishes the stakes and justifies the logic of the world very well while also doing fantastic world building, but it is agreed generally to be one of the weaker episodes, whereas my pilot does all of those same things and is agreed generally to be one of the strongest episodes out of 12 freaking seasons. Well, I have something to say about Rick and Morty. It may set up the story, but it also changes a lot of it. Like, Rick is really compassionate in that episode, which does not follow through until about season two where that character trait actually comes back. And Jerry's actually kind of smart, which is not his character trait at all. So I think that one thing with the pilot is uh, after they made it, they decided to change a lot of things. Amy, you better jump in there. Man. Yeah, it's okay. So so going back to what you said about dis- dismissing Rick and Morty, how it wouldn't exist because of Futurama, that's like saying that future, uh, Supernatural, uh, just dismissing it because, oh, you know, it's a, it's a show about hunting ghosts and stuff. You know, oh, if Ghostbusters never happened. Oh, if all these other shows no, never happened. No, 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 no. Because- I'm saying your pilot wouldn't happen because the creators of Rick and Morty, like, they quote Futurama and The Simpsons as their heavy insp- inspirations. So if Futurama didn't happen, for sure Rick and Morty wouldn't happen. Oh, exactly. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, one, one thing that I have to say about Supernatural is uh, boring. The, the pilot episode. <laughs> Tell that to twelve seasons. The pilot okay. episode has been done a lot. Like, there's a lot of shows that use. Okay, uh, kids watch their mom die, and then they vow to find the person that killed him. Cool. I haven't seen it's, that before. It's okay. Cool. The pilot episode of Supernatural. I mean, the fan base of Supernatural is massive. It's a huge pop culture phenomenon. Everyone. It's not only is it huge, but it's also really inclusive. Yeah. Like people really bond over this show and their love of Sam and Dean Winchester, and that relationship which is the driving force of this entire show has been for over 200 episodes now 12 seasons there's that's al- established right off the bat in the pilot there's and also like two billion people that consider themselves memers so I, w- I don't know if i'd consider a fan base one of the things that uh <laughs> adds it in. oh yeah like if you're talking about the quality of the episode of the one episode uh, creates a fan base like i'm a fan of the rocky horror picture show it's a great movie and there's a great cult following but or sorry, I take that back. It's not really that good of a movie. <laughs> sorry, uh, it's it's not. But yeah, no. people still bond and love over it because yeah. they relish in its um its ridiculousness. And I think um, well, another thing I had about uh, Supernatural was I almost felt like the special effects in that episode sort of destroyed the tone that it was setting. And of course, you know, it's only the pilot episode; they're expected to get better. But it's still as a pilot episode, I feel like they could have been a lot better. I mean, it was it was mid thousands. The special effects are gonna be what they're gonna be. Like, I think as there's a reason why it's it's the longest running fantasy show in North America. There's a reason why the CW keeps you know renewing it year after year. There's a reason why so many people travel across the world to go see these actors at conventions to discuss in depth and in detail. I do want to hear some thoughts like based against like future I'm hearing a okay, lot between. Okay. Like, I, I think I I think that. Uh, Supernatural sets up a lot, but I don't know if it's necessarily in part to its pilot episode. I think it's in part to the the entirety of the show or the first season. Also, if you want to go back when you had said about them changing the personalities of the characters, there was a lot of that that happened in Futurama. Like, Bender in the first episode is very different than Bender by the end of the series. To an extent. I mean, it's... I mean, yeah, character even... development is going to happen. Absolutely. <laughs> like... so, so you shouldn't dismiss my first uh, pilot episode because they decided to develop the characters further. But yours is like a stark difference from first episode to second episode. Jerry is like really smart and he's talking about how he wants to save his family and then in the second one he's playing a balloon popping game on his phone. (laughs) My argument against Futurama is going to be like I I enjoy the Futurama pilot. Um, Again, as far as like that's not usually my thing but the Futurama pilot I think did a good job of kind of setting up the rest of the season but my issue is that I didn't get enough character in that pilot episode, mm-hmm. whereas, like, as, you know, Supernatural's really character-driven, and I got a lot of who Sam and Dean are right off the bat in their first interactions with each other Supernatural in also was 43 minutes long, while Futurama was only True. 15. True. It's hard. I mean, it is hard to compare, like, sitcom versus drama, yeah. but... Okay, I got awesome arguments from all of you. Now we're going to go to introductions with Nick coming this way. So, Nick, you start. Outroductions? Con- conclusions. conclusions. I mean. Okay. Sorry. Um, yeah, I just think that uh, Futurama wasn't touched on a lot in this debate because there's clearly a lot more problems with Rick and Morty and Supernatural. Uh, <laughs> I, I just think Futurama does a perfect job of, of explaining what happened. Like, he, he goes ahead a thousand years and it's perfectly understandable from watching the episode. So I think it sets up a lot of story and, and you know immediately what's wrong. All right. And let's go, Eamon. 
Um, one thing that you would point about Rick and Morty's pilot episode not being the greatest episode, I think that's a testament to the rest of the series about the fact that this one pilot episode, even though it's not the best, got so many people hooked on the show to the point where they're you know demanding that the the third season be made earlier, and uh, and that has built so much of a fan base in the small amount of time it's been on the air. All right, and then Sarah. Supernatural is a huge part of pop culture. The fan base is huge and global, and the fans also have a strong connection to the characters, and have had that connection to these characters from day one. The pilot makes us love Sam and Dean, and we're interested in their story because the characters are compelling. The family dynamic that is introduced in the pilot still holds up and has been brought back in season 12. You ask almost any fan of Supernatural for their top 10 list of Supernatural episodes, and I guarantee you the pilot is on that list. Wow. All right. A lot of passion. Can nice. I mention that I'm dressed like Fry from Futurama? Oh. I was that know. done on purpose? <laughs> it was. That's okay. awesome. So. All right. Uh, Vaughn, was there, was there any? Um, so TV shows are difficult to find, or especially episodes of TV shows are pretty difficult to find, like, critical ratings of. But um, IMDb is the best thing I could find. Um, Futurama's pilot episode has an 8.7. Uh, Rick and Morty, Rick and Morty's pilot episode has an 8.3, and Supernatural has an 8.8. Ooh! Wow, so all pretty even on that front then. Wow, so this one was pretty tough. Um, crew, is there any insight on that? Um, Nick, yeah. Yeah, um, Nick won. Uh, Nick <laughs> has Nick hit both of them hardest. He had the best oh, he took notes. The best argument. If you could see this, he took notes. Sarah, Sarah admitted that she liked the pilot of Futurama, and that's a big. That's always a big knock when I'm judging or when I'm debating. Um, she also continuing to argue the fan base, the fan base, the fan base. That's not substance about why your pilot is the best. Yeah, you might have a bunch of fans, but that doesn't necessarily make a good pilot. Mm-hmm. Uh, I definitely think she deserves second, but she doesn't have. A, there's not enough pure knocking against Futurama to give her first. And Amen, you gave it your best shot, but you got, you got <laughs> it on both sides. And there's just nothing you could have done. Next Man, night, it's almost like gotcha. you like judged a show before. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. Well. Uh, anyone else thoughts or? All right. Um, yeah, one thing I do have to agree with is Amen. They kind of did cream you on that. <laughs> yeah, I, it's, I'm, you I'm have, really. The feeling... thing is, it's like when you get a now that you have a feel for how yeah. the fight goes, it's like you know, like you need to get in there and like you know. <laughs> interrupt people sometimes you know it's not the funnest thing to do but to get your point in through you sometimes you got to cut people off and say well this is what i have to say but with that being said yeah they just got way too much against you and i could list some of the things but i'm sure we all kind of agree on that <laughs> so it came down to nick and sarah and you guys were like yeah battling for each other's throats however i didn't hear enough against futurama um it was all about you had a lot prepared prepped more in favor to fight against rick and morty as mm-hmm. opposed to futurama and like like again, what Nick said, um, with the fact that when you complimented Futurama saying you wouldn't have Rick and Morty if it wasn't with that, and that all just kind of brought it up to where Nick gets first place, Sarah gets second, and Amy gets third. So I would say that a show is nothing without its fan base. That's so. true. All right, yeah. All right, cool. All right, <laughs> good fight, guys. That was really good. Um, let's go to our second round. Um, <laughs> we argue all the time in our room, so it's like this is no different. Right. That's awesome. Uh, so our second round is going to be best one-liner. Now, um, a lot of you had pretty variety of cho- choices, so yeah. um, we're going to start with Eamon with his introduction first, and uh, whenever you're ready. Okay. So I'm going to start off with one of the most iconic one-liners of all time, and uh, that is from Batman the movie, starring uh, the the. Um, famous Adam West, the best Batman, and uh, it, and it's a, the famous scene where um, he's he's holding a bomb and he's trying to find a place to get rid of it with hurting the least amount of people, and he looks around and he stares right in the camera and says, "Some days you just can't get rid of a bomb," and I think it perfectly sums up the goofy tone of the 1960s Adam West Batman uh, TV show and films, and it per- it. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Uh, a good man. It's a, it's see the line. It's symbolic of life, you know, because we all have this bomb weighing on our shoulders that we all need to find a place to just release all that that negative energy. So, so you know, some days we all just can't get rid of a bomb. Man, that really took a deep turn. <laughs> <laughs> we all have a bomb. <laughs> all right, cool. Uh, let's do uh, Nick next with introduction. All right. Um, so I chose. The line, Our Lady of Blessed Acceleration, Don't Fail Me Now, from Blues Brothers. And uh, it's a classic among many. And I think 
I, I knew that I wanted to do something from Blues Brothers, and there are multiple lines I could have chosen. Uh, but I chose this one because every time I watch it, it does not fail to make me laugh the hardest out of the entire movie. And in, in the Blues Brothers, if you haven't seen it, it's about two orphans who went to jail, and then they come back, and their orphanage is going to be shut down. So their entire mission, they're on a mission from God. Uh, they are going to uh, bring their band back together to, cr to raise the money to save the orphanage. And the entire thing is laced with religious elements, even though they themselves have stated that they're not religious, but they're doing it for the nuns and everyone at the orphanage. So they're, they're in a car chase because they're doing bad stuff trying to get the money. And he says, Our Lady of Blessed Acceleration, don't, me, don't fail me now. And that is just iconic to me. All right, pretty good. And Sarah? So for me, a movie one-liner is an iconic line from a film that is representative of the film as a whole. The line I chose isn't just iconic, it's legendary. And it represents arguably the biggest franchise in pop culture, and that's May the Force Be With You from, of course, Star Wars. Star Wars kind of created the concept of popular culture that we understand today. Nothing was as big as Star Wars before it came out. It was groundbreaking in visual effects. Everyone knows it across the world. Force Awakens is the third highest grossing movie of all time, and I don't think there's a line that embodies Star Wars quite like May the Force Be With You. It's on t-shirts, on bumper stickers. People have tattoos of this line. It's empowering, it's uplifting, it's an integral part of this entire franchise. The 4th of May is entirely dedicated to loving Star Wars because of this line alone. I don't think you get any bigger than Star Wars, and I don't think you get a line more iconic than May the Force Be With You. Wow. Another really good intro. All right, there's an open forum. There's an argument, so let's go ahead and start with that. To me, a one-liner is a line that's said once. Force, uh, may the force be with you is not a one-liner. It is said 14 times, but the seven <laughs> main series Star Wars films and variations of the lines are said many times as well. Okay, okay. Did you guys, um, like, team up on this? No, so, we both so happened to research in, it in In preparation time. for this debate, I did, I did uh, a quick Google search, just best one-liners in film. And May the Force Be With You was on every single list that I found. Was that on The Onion? No, it wasn't on The Onion. It was like a part of, I don't know, the American Film Institute and their list of iconic lines what from do movies. They know? And even if you just want to focus on the first time that it's said in A New Hope, even then it's still, it's still an amazing moment because it's not said by a Jedi, it's said by Han Solo as this means of empowerment to Luke Skywalker, our hero for the rest of this franchise. That's cool. Vaughn, can you look that up, like, how many times it's said? Oh, yeah, 14. Oh, oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that just goes to prove that the, you know, the original line was so important that first time it was said in A New Hope that it went on to become iconic and legendary for the entire franchise as a whole. If you had heard yippee ki Mother Effer in Die Hard more than once, it would have lost its appeal. I don't think I don't think that's valid. I think that's an extremely iconic line from Die Hard. It's right up there with um, "Hasta la vista, baby," and "I'll be back" from yeah. Terminator, which were two of the examples we were given in the email for this there debate. You go. I, I do think that the reason, uh, the fact that <laughs> it's said, you out. <laughs> <laughs> the, the fact that it's said so many times too, kind so. of decreases its value to me. Where I feel like it's it's one of those things that the characters by the you know by the time all the movies happen, it's something they just kind of say in conversation. You know, oh, may the force be with you. And I feel like my line, some days you just can't get rid of a bomb, it fits so well because it's the perfect tension reliever for this big dramatic moment of Batman trying to relieve Gotham City of this bomb. I think, I think we just have very different uh, definitions of one-liners. And for me, a one-liner is just something that's iconic. And I don't think you get any more iconic than May the Force Be With You from Star Wars. I mean, it's everyone, regardless if you've seen any movie from Star Wars, you know that line and you know where it's from and you know that it's, it's held at a very high level of importance for the fans. One thing that I want to say about Eamon's point, uh, when, he was doing, when you were doing your description, you said the best Batman was Adam West. Well, oh, I, no. 100%. No. Here's the I thing, disagree though. with that wholeheartedly. Knowing Eamon, I know who his <laughs> favorite Batman is. It is not Adam West. It is Kevin Conroy. And he was upset that people would not debate Kevin Conroy in a best Batman debate. So that right I there mean, dispels the, your entire argument. Some days you just get can't get rid here. of a bomb. It's not even... There, there and there. There's plenty of doors for you It's not even the best one-liner from a Batman film. And like, what, what out is, of what, all the what, Batman what, what, films... What is the best one-liner from a Batman For film? me, it's Why So Serious from The Dark Knight. Yeah. Like, that's right. that's far more iconic and has a whole lot more of deep connotations than someday you just can't get rid of a bomb. Just because something's cheeky does not make it amazing. I mean, that's why... Oh, yeah. no, no one said it has to have a whole bunch of... Uh, okay, I'm... I'm really. Let's talk about. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about Blues Brothers, all right? No, so, no, no, we can no, talk no, about okay. Batman. So, <laughs> I'm fine with that. Okay, Blues Brothers. Um, 
Our Lady of Blessed Acceleration and Fail Me Now. Um, it's a great line, but it's not even the best line from Blues Brothers. What would you What would you My, say the best I line mean, from Blues Brothers? I mean, of course, there's one mission from God, but yeah, I which think which is said multiple which, times. Which is, yeah, again. but I, in my in my opinion, the best line is uh, "No man, we're musicians." I think at, at any Ooh, other I may of the agree lines, with that one. Yeah, one of the at reasons. any of the lines from Blues Brothers, besides "We're on a mission from God," that su- that perfectly represents Blues Brothers as a whole. It's it's uh, no man, we're musicians. One of the reasons why I did not choose that is because my definition of a one-liner not only being said once is that it is said out of context and not in a sentence. So like some days you can't get rid of a bomb said just randomly. It's not in a conversation. Same with may the force be with you. Most of the time it's not said in a conversation. No, I think that's, that can be said regardless, like apropos of well, nothing. It, it can, but I'm saying like <laughs> most of the time it's out of a conversation. So is our lady of blessed acceleration. I feel like no man musicians is a great line, but I wouldn't consider it a one lighter because it's in reply to, to a question. Let me make one final point on a uh, may the force be <laughs> okay. with you. So, you know, um, I, I grew up uh, going to a Catholic school, you know, and so there's the you know if anybody's been to a Catholic mass they say may the Lord, Lord be, with be with you, you. no and yeah also with you and all, and with your spirit you know Catholic. and I oh, am gonna yeah. I'm sick and tired of all these you know youth ministers or whatever trying to be cool and say <laughs> and you know talk about Star Wars may the force be with you and also with you <laughs> and with your spirit and I'm like no it's time for it to stop <laughs> and it, we would never have had this problem if that line was never uttered you. Star Wars ruined Catholicism. Yes. You heard it here first, <laughs> folks. I That's what I, 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 no, ruined I think, Catholicism. I think the line may the force be with you <laughs> as far right? as as far as representing, I don't know, maybe the biggest franchise in film. Jesus I think, used to be the only hope, and now it's Obi Wan Kenobi. This is it's, it's all Star I, Wars' fault. I don't want to be here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> right, with that, we're done. All right. <laughs> Wow, that got really deep real quick. First, it's like a bomb, and now it's like a ruined Catholicism. So, okay, cool. You heard it here at Cardinal Film Bites. Um, let's do introductions, starting with Nick. All right. Um, again, not many people touched on my subject. So uh, I would say that it's a, a pretty standalone line. It falls under my definition of one-liner, at least. And I think it perfect, perfectly um, wraps up the entirety of blues brothers because everything is on faith in that movie even if they don't have any it is still on faith and i think that's something really cool and uh star wars ruined blues brothers because of the catholics thing so (laughs) okay (laughs) and uh we'll go sarah next um i don't think a one-liner has to be funny nor do i think it needs to be said once i just think it needs to be iconic I think mine is the obvious choice because my one-liner represents the biggest pop culture phenomenon in film. Star Wars is loved by billions of people across all generations, ethnicities, genders, classes. The franchise is truly legendary. And as far as iconic lines go, I don't think you get any bigger than May the Force Be With You. All right. And then Eamon to finish it up. Some days you just can't get rid of a bomb. (laughs) Fully sums up the, the... Nature of the 1960s Batman films. You may not like them for their their you know their just oddball humor, but you really have to appreciate what they did to introduce Batman into popular culture to millions of people. And I think that this line from this fantastic movie um, was one thing that really brought it all together. Great, awesome. Um, like I said, at Vaughn, was there any facts to check up on? Um, everything I caught checked out. All right. Uh, this is hard because I went to Catholic school too, Eamon, so I, I know that <laughs> oh, so <you> much. <laughs> Star Wars um, single-handedly ruined Catholicism. I don't think that's a valid point. <laughs> what, do you, what do you guys think? I wasn't Real. trying to bring religion uh, into this. That was, <laughs> keep that was on you. I mean, personally, I don't think any of them get first place. Um, okay. Same. But, I mean, if I had to pick, I mean, there just wasn't enough. There wasn't enough substance amongst any of them. Just who do you think won? Sarah. Okay. Thank you. I agree. I I think I agree with that too. I think Nick, in your conclusion, you're right in saying that no one touched on yours a lot, but part of that's because a lot all she had needed to say was like t-shirts and like tattoos. I mean, like it's all true. I mean, the line is so more resonant with society than your line is, and she touched that. on that very well. She didn't have to bash on yours as much because like she just had to say which one is more yeah. prominent society. Um, with that being said, it was really hard to pick second and third because. Come on, that can't get rid of a bomb. That deep talk was actually pretty cool. <laughs> I'll be honest. It's like, I liked how, because you guys both said what makes a one liner is it's set out of context, which really would fit yours almost more. How it's just like, there's no reason for him to look right into the camera and say, sometimes you can't get rid of a bomb. Or it's like, so I think in terms of that, and it's a tension reliever, 
And I think when you fought on his, it's that it's not even the best kind. And I understand you defended it pretty well, but it's still kind of stuck with like, there are a lot of one liners to choose from. And that being said, I think he, Eamon picked the one that resonated most with, most with his movie. So I'm going to pick Eamon for second and then Nick with third. But that was my order as well. That was yeah. a really <laughs> good fight, guys. That was awesome. So um, going on around three, this will be best movie twist. And intro will start with, have we started with you before, Nick? I'm going to say, no, let's, yeah. no, no, let's start Nick introductions. All right. So uh, I chose best movie twist planet of the apes. Um, that is probably one of the most classic uh, movie twists and one of the first. Um, a, a lot of people don't necessarily think about it at first, but that's just because it's been for such a long time. And it's so ingrained in pop culture. Like Eamon and I were playing the Simpsons game the other day, completely unrelated, but they make a reference to the movie twist in planet of the apes. And for those of you who don't know, Planet of the Apes. Spoiler alert, by the way. Spoiler alert. Collective, <laughs> collective spoiler alert. Yeah, so yeah. for those of you who don't know, Planet of the Apes, these people come on an alien planet that is completely run by apes, and it's there's just a lot of mayhem and whatever. But at the very end, they're exploring the planet, and they find the Statue of Liberty sunken into the ground, which is then realized that it's an alternate timeline, and it's actually Earth. They, apes had taken over Earth. It's not like the Mark Wahlberg one where he sees the Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no. Um, but yeah, so that's that's one of the the biggest movie twist of all time, I think. And that's why I chose it. All right. Awesome. And let's go aim in second then. So greatest movie twist. Um, the only thing that came to my mind was of course, fight club is often regarded as one of the greatest movie twists ever. Um, for those of you who don't know, it involved the fight club is about um, Edward Norton's character and getting involved with Brad Pitt, Brad Pitt's character, whose name is Tyler Durden. And um, they go around and, uh, cause mayhem throughout the city, and they start, of course, fight clubs where they try and relieve the stress of everyday life. And it turns out by the end of the film um, <clears throat> that Edward Norton's character um, has, like, split personality uh, disorder, and his, like, the id of his personality is embodied through Tyler Durden. And you discover that they're both the same person. It almost, it's almost changes the genre of the film by the time you reach the twist. And that's, to me, it's a good twist. It makes you rethink everything that happened prior to that point in the movie. Really cool. And Sarah. Thinking about movie twists, there were a handful of movies that came to mind, but I chose to go with the twist that one, I didn't see coming, and two, I actually kind of had debates about this movie after I saw it, and that's Shutter Island. Shutter Island paints itself as this dark psychological thriller mystery, great cast with Leonardo DiCaprio, Mark Ruffalo, Sir Ben Kingsley, directed by Martin Scorsese. It's highly rated, and overall it's a great neo-noir film. And the twist, I think, is absolutely genius, again, spoilers, uh, that Teddy, which is Leonardo DiCaprio's character, is actually a patient at Shutter Island, and the entire film is just this role-playing exercise that he has with his psychiatrist. Uh, the ending, I think, is also ambiguous enough, and DiCaprio does such a great job that the first time I saw it, I believed Teddy that it was all just a conspiracy against him, that he actually wasn't crazy. And I think it begs to be rewatched, not just because the film, not just to see the film like through the twist, but to come to the conclusion if Teddy is actually crazy. And I also think the twist enhances the movie itself, adding another layer of depth to the characters and overall emotional complexity to the narrative. Awesome. And let's go to our five minute open forum. So starting off with Planet of the Apes, um, yes, it's an iconic twist, but I don't think it does much to change the way like the narrative is structured. It says, oh, it's not this sci-fi reality. It's another sci-fi reality. You're like, okay, what effect does that have on the plot? What effect does it have on the characters? And by the time you reach that twist, the movie's over, so there's no time to explore why it's so poignant. The problem that I have with fight clubs is that if you pay attention to the movie, it's not all that surprising. Yeah, I that's I saw both of these coming. Uh, when I, I watched both of these over the weekend to prep for this debate, and I, I saw fight clubs coming beforehand. I called it like right before the reveal. I turned to my roommate, and I was like, is Tyler not real? And then yeah. boom, like Tyler's not real. I also so many, Planet of the Apes so many times. sets up the twist within the first ten minutes of the movie oh, with yeah. the with the uh, with Taylor talking about like how time and space is different than time on Earth. And when they crash landed on the planet, I assumed it was Earth until I was kind of informed otherwise. And even still, they were like, "Just kidding, we really don't know where we are." So I was like, "So it's Earth, right?" So like the twist didn't. I was like, "Oh, it's just everything I already knew." Yeah. Also, the fact that uh, the new Dawn prequel trilogy is destroying that twist yeah. <laughs> also kind of shows, it lessens the, the importance of it. And I think the fact that it is so um, parodied and so often referenced to also 
I mean, you could. It's it's an argument that yeah, it's it's so obvious that like that's why people always talk about it. The Fight Club, the fans of Fight Club, and people who've who've watched it have purposely gone out of their way to make sure like people who are going to see it don't know the twist before they go into the film. And I think that's what's important is that you have fans that care so much about having the effect of the film hit the audience. Well, I think that if if people did know the twist going into the movie, it would be even more obvious to the audience because mm-hmm. there there are so many references to the fact that no one knows who Tyler is but, and that they confuse the two characters I mean, often. I, the, when uh, the narrator got a call on a payphone, I was like, you can't do that. No one, like, can you call back on a payphone? Yes, yes you can. You can that is yeah. true. But that's like, that's my yes, first, my first instinct was like, what? I, like, that's, that's not something to where I, my belief was already suspended. And they and never also, once say the narrator's name. And I think that's one of the mm-hmm. big tip offs because his name is Tyler, which is Brad Pitt's character. But you see, all, I think that's what's so incredible about it. If you go back and watch the movie a second time, you pick up on everything that you might not have seen the first time around. And then everything starts to slowly make even more sense with each consecutive viewing of the film. For me, my my biggest issue with Fight Club, actually, is that I don't think the twist is medically sound. And for a weird like film nerd like me, I don't think dissociative identity disorder works that way, where you can have two different personalities and have one personality that views the other personality as a separate entity um, and have both personalities talking to each other and interacting with each other simultaneously. I just, I don't think that's how dissociative identity disorder works. And it's a conversation I had with my roommate while we were watching the movie. And it's something that actually kind of bothered me as I was watching it. I was like, I mean, belief is already suspended in movies. It's all, it's film does that. But like, I, I was watching it and then the twist happened, and I was like, but I don't think that's possible. I would well, agree it's, with that. The, the whole tone of the, the movie already has sort of a surreal tone. You already know this isn't supposed to be our reality, I sense. And if you're going for medically accurate, I'm not sure how medically accurate Shutter Island's twist would be. I'm not sure if that's how schizophrenia would be. Schizophrenia is, is living in, in a world of delusion and seeing things and dealing with amnesia. Um, dealing with hallucinations, and I think that I think it's portrayed uh, fairly accurately in Shutter Island. Whereas, like uh, Ed Norton's character in Fight Club seems to have like aspects of dissociative identity disorder and schizophrenia, um, both when that's not something that can happen uh, mentally for someone. Something like, I did. I did a pretty decent Google search before this, and everything that I could find is like the hallucinations of him physically seeing Tyler as well as having um, split personalities, because like hallucinations is a characteristic of schizophrenia, um, but split personality is not. Well, something that I think about Shutter Island is that um, Shutter Island and Fight Club along just in the same boat, the all in the imagination twist has been done a lot. And I, I feel like Plan- Planet of the Apes, even if it's not that surprising or if it's not like you can call it from the beginning or whatever you guys think may, may be the thing, the fact that it's classic and it's still yet to be it's not often replicated. There's the all in the imagination twist, which is used a lot, but the just it's just such an iconic twist that no one's really tried to touch it except but in parodies. For me, the first time I watched Shutter Island, it was ambiguous enough where I didn't think it was all in his imagination. I mean, upon further rewatching, you can come to that conclusion that Teddy's actually crazy. But the first time I watched it, I wanted to believe Teddy that it was a conspiracy against him. Mm, wow. All right, I got medical real quick. <laughs> so um, I, do, I do my research, friends. Let's start with uh, Sarah on conclusions. Personally, the best twists in movies are the ones that you don't see coming. And for both Fight Club and Planet of the Apes, I saw those twists coming. A uh, great twist enhance the narrative, not take away from it. They're timed really well in the story, and they keep the movie rewatchable. And I think Shutter Island does all these things really well, on top of it being a great psychological thriller with an awesome cast and a top-notch director. All right, and then let's go to Nick. All right, I'd say that um, Planet of the Apes just being iconic in the in the way that it is is one of the reasons why it's one of the greatest movie twists of all time. And I think things like Fight Club, I called about halfway through the movie. And for Shutter Island, I don't think that a twist leaving more questions is necessarily argument for a good twist. So I think Planet of the Apes is simple, straight to the point, and iconic. All right, and then Eamon. Fight Club is the best twist because, as you said about enhancing the narrative, Fight Club not only enhances the narrative, it changes the narrative in a sense. So each time, if you watch the movie again, you, you, you see it in a different light and you see the story unfold in a different way. I don't really see that as much with Shutter Island or with Planet of the Apes. All right. Sure. Simple. 
Um, this one's kind of hard. Uh, any thoughts? Yeah, Dylan. I think Eamon loses because he broke the first rule of Fight Club. You don't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, true. Now as I think about that. Uh, well, Vaughn, was there any cleanup on that? No, unless you want Rotten Tomatoes scores. I think it's fine because okay. we're not debating about against movies. It's just the twist right, itself. Yeah. Um, yeah, Nick. Uh, I would give it. I would. Th- hey, this has been the best uh, round so far. Uh, but I would give it. I think uh, Eamon won this one because he defended his points well and he attacked both people uh, with very solid arguments. Then I would probably give it to Sarah and then Nick. I disagree. Well, <laughs> <laughs> say what else is new? What? Yeah, what do you think? I think Nick got me with the like all in the mind thing. I mean, those two can be wiped out because they're the same twist, in my opinion. Mm. Mm. Good point. That's kind of true. Now, as I think about that, um, yeah, this was really kind of hard I, because um, Eamon's point against Nick, where he said that the twist for your movie doesn't really do anything to the plot was a really strong pull. And I didn't get anything to defend that. And so, but that was, that was a huge thing. And plus he got like the Dawn prequel trilogy, like destroys that twist. Cause we now all know. And I, I mean, I don't necessarily think that prequel movies would change the fact that it's the one movie. I, twist, I, and yeah, and I, I understand that, but it's like, my point is like, I got a lot more arguments. That I didn't see defended pretty well. Um, <clears throat> Sarah, you also had really good arguments though. Like when you did, did you really do like all the research? Like yeah, medical? like, and like it's we well, were. I was watching Fight Club with my roommate, and she had seen the movie b- before uh, multiple times, and it was my first time seeing it. And like as the movie was wrapping up, I'm on my phone googling uh, yeah. dissociative yeah. identity disorder b- to try to figure out if that's physically <clears throat> possible. And I, I just don't think it is. Yeah, and I think going with that, that really does also help too. So all in all, this is just really, really hard. But I think overall, and I know you debated against his argument with how you know you could say the same thing for in the mind thing might not be exactly um correct either but then you also said that um it's a movie and you even concurred with that it's like you know reality is going to be a little bit distorted in any kind of other sense and so with that being the case i gotta go with aiming with the first place point and um for second place this is harder um i think because you did do the extra research. I'm gonna give Sarah second and then Nick third. So, um, but that was that was pr- the best one. So in actuality, like after I watched Fight Club, I was like, dang it, this movie's really really good. <laughs> like, oh yeah, they're all good like, movies oh, that yeah. you picked, and I, the twists are all good too. All right, so that brings us to our fourth final question, and um, this is also double points as well. And ready. let's just get right to it. It is which movie should be a musical? So I'm really excited for this one. And let's start with uh, Eamon. All right. So uh, best movie uh, movie that should be a musical, I chose UHF, which is a 1989, fact check me on that, please, I don't remember, um, cult classic uh, starring Weird Al Yankovic. And 89, I, I, yes. And, you know, yeah, I believe it was written by him, too, or in some capacity. And I, I honestly think it's... If you've never seen the movie, it's about a guy who becomes the manager of a public access television station and just starts creating all this huge outlandish programming and gains a lot of traction. And I think it would work well as a musical, not only because um, you could have some great satire of not only TV shows that are on the air and musicals that are, that are on Broadway at the time, but I also think it's the, the natural progression of Weird Al Yankovic's career. And I think that if we had a musical on Broadway with... A, with um, Music and lyrics by one of the greatest um, comedians and lyricists of our time. It would be a smash hit. So UHF. Is it UHF or UAF? UHF. UHF. Oh, okay. Got that wrong. And let's go with Nick next. Hercules. Disney's Hercules. Disney can take any movie and make it into a musical. Why hasn't it been Hercules? Hercules is such an underrated Disney movie, and it has such a cult following. It's not represented anywhere in Disney World, uh, at least in the Americas or Disneyland. There, it just no one ever m- remembers Hercules, and I think that there are so many songs that could be written. Hades could have a song. There are so many different. Um, just things you can do with Hercules that hasn't been done. And one of the things that makes me most upset is they were writing one and then Frozen came out and they scrapped it and started working on a Frozen musical. So I think Hercules is by far over, like, it, it just needs one. It's time. It's time for a Hercules musical. All right. 
I'm like, what I'm writing is like currently writing, but frozen. <laughs> but frozen. <laughs> That's always been a thing, but frozen happened. Frozen. Okay. Frozen. So now Sarah. So I used to be a hardcore theater kid in high school, and one of my favorite musicals I was ever a part of was Spamalot, which was based off of Mighty Python and the Holy Grail. Keeping this in mind, I thought, what other cult classic would make a great parody musical? And it came to me, The Princess Bride. The coolest thing about parody musicals is that each number can be inspired by another famous musical. Imagine. Epic choreographed stage fighting between Wesley and Inigo, both of them jabbing at each other while singing about great swordsmen. They are kind of like Agony from Into the Woods, but with swords. A beautiful yet hilarious self-aware love song between Wesley and Buttercup, like the song that goes like this from Spamalot. A grandiose introduction number for Vicini, complete with a kick line, very vaudevillian. Um, and my personal favorite, an epic rap battle of wits a la the cabinet battles from the biggest hit on Broadway right now, Hamilton. It's a heartfelt and hilarious story with great characters and memorable lines and with potential for a great, great original music. I think it can adapt brilliantly for the stage. Okay, now before we start, I want to let you two know that that introduction was killer. So with that being said, going into the 5 minute open forum, so just to let you guys know, because I would see yours in a heartbeat, just saying Thank from you. that pitch. But I'm not going to take that away. I'm just saying she had a really good introduction. So whenever you guys are ready with the open forum. So so what would set Princess Bride apart as a parody musical from other musicals? I think UHF would work better as a parody musical because you're not limited to the fairy tale world of the Princess Bride. You can do anything you want like you're creating a TV show. Also, since it's limited to the, the fairy tale world, I feel like it'd be too much like Shrek. Because Shrek, Shrek on Broadway mm -hmm. is um, it's very much a parody of a lot of the Disney shows that are on oh, Broadway, Shrek of course. Shrek is one of my favorite musicals. You don't have to tell me. Oh, yeah. And, well, <laughs> there it's, you go. It's because I think, I think that just even further proves my point. Spamalot, Something Rotten, uh, Shrek. It's, they're all great musicals that poke fun of musicals in general. They do well. Parody musicals do extremely well on Broadway. And I think Princess Bride lends itself brilliantly to and that. And that's why I think Weird Al Yankovic's UHF would be perfect. Who would not go see a, a brand new musical with brand new songs by Weird Al. His record deal expired, I think, last year. And so now um, he's, look, he's looking for something to do. And I think if um, bringing back UHF and updating it to the modern audience, I think would be phenomenal. I think that uh, UH what? No one yeah. has seen the movie. I exactly. have. Exactly. But that's just because I, I follow Weird Al to, to the extent where I will look up things that he's been in and watch his movie. It is not, I wouldn't even consider it a cult classic. To be honest, I don't think because, it has a big enough following. Well, if, it doesn't if, have a big if, enough following. It's a great movie, but it's not. It wouldn't. I don't think it would gain traction. I, if well, it was I mean, on a Broadway. lot. Of, a lot of times, what happens when you adapt a movie to a musical? Sometimes the musical gets even more traction. Look at Little Shop of Horrors from 1960 with Jack Nicholson. No one cared about that movie. Then once they came out with the musical, it was a smash hit, and they made a movie adaptation of the musical, which is even bigger success than the original. I feel like that's not enough uh, veracity to to need that because there have been so many great musicals like as a theater major i love musicals and there's there have been so many that failed on broadway that could have gone and they've made revivals and they've come back but i just don't think that uhf would make a good when you talk musical. about uh, musicals that make it on broadway there was already a hercules musical written for the disney cruise line and a lot of times what they'll do is what disney will do when they make a lot of musicals They'll send them to the Disney Cruise or to the Disney amusement parks to see how well they do. That's why Aladdin, one of the reasons why Aladdin has a Broadway adaptation is because it did so well at Los Angeles at the Hyperion Theater. Their musical adaptation. Yeah, I have. I can so what's go that on. saying like with so, the fact it was written for a cruise? What it was saying was, and I've, I've seen it on, there's a YouTube version of it, and it's, it's not that good. And I think, you know, if the fact that it couldn't get off the ground from the Disney Cruise and not onto Broadway is testament. I think if it hasn't been made already, then it's not, and there's no reason to make it. I think yeah, that my, if they had gotten Alan Menken to help with it, then it would have gotten a lot better. My issue didn't. with your pitch as Hercules as a musical is that, like, yeah, you have a lot of really popular Disney musicals. Most of them are from the Disney Renaissance, and, you know, that was my childhood. I love Hercules as a musical, but I just don't think um, it suits itself very well for stage. Um, and I'm going to direct your attention to Aladdin. Like, yeah, it got its feet off of the ground from a park, but on Broadway, it kind of flopped. It didn't do nearly as well as it's what Disney was expecting. It's still running on Broadway. 
but it's not it's not pulling the numbers what they expected um and Which musical did you say aladdin. aladdin aladdin and i think the reason that aladdin was really difficult to adapt for the stage as well as why it's not doing as well is because it doesn't have huge ensemble numbers and it has these larger than life characters that are really hard for a single actor to pull off and i think hercules has those exact same issues where there really aren't big ensemble numbers the only ensemble you have is the muses and while they're awesome there's only five people that's not very fitting no. for a musical and you have larger than life characters like all the gods that i don't think any single actor would be able to pull yeah, like, off especially all that... the stunts in hercules like when he's fighting the hydra and oh, stuff all the, you... the montage yeah. of oh, yeah, like yeah. his training montage there's no way there's you, no could, way actually, make you could actually make scenes out of hercules seven trials though and one thing i have to say about princess bride is i feel the same way about that because in, in examples like spamalot you were using as an example God is a character in Spamalot, and he is shown as God. And mm -hmm. I think that Princess Bride has so much to it in the movie that it would almost be taking away from the movie if you were trying to make a musical. And that I would be really also, hard. I, I would Bride. not want to see rapping in the Princess Bride. No, no, that's, no. that's a, that's a and challenge no, I for think, me. And it's, I think that's because that's what is is selling on Broadway right now. And I would love to see an epic. I mean, epic rap battles on YouTube are huge. I, so Princess like, Bride is just so, to make so, money then. If yeah, you're so put it on it's just a cash grab to try and write off the coattails of Look, other Broadway. Any, you're you're changing so the many, source uh, material to try and fit what's popular. There are so many Broadway musicals that open and close in a night. You've got to do what you got to do to make money and you got to do what's what's really popular and i think if you get and that's a why great team for that's great why you that, that's, that's why you great original, no, you for great original music work. for great original music a brand new score new songs um my movie has the highest ratings on rotten tomatoes over both of yours so and no one was uhf so, so <laughs> ooh, I have so many other things on. wow that got nasty <laughs> real quick okay uh let's go nick first on conclusion all right, um, Disney's Hercules. It's just, I don't know what else to say about it other than the fact that it's Disney Hercules. I think that just because they tried it on a cruise does not mean that that completely negates it. It was, the cruise things are like 30 minutes long. They try to condense the story. There are no new songs added. There's so much you can do with a full length Hercules that no one has tried. And the fact that Frozen bumped it out, I think is more of a reason to give it a chance to thrive. All right, and then Sarah. In a difficult and cutthroat world of theater, the musicals that make it to Broadway are the ones that have a big name behind them. The Princess Bride is fun. It's adored by many and quoted by all. It has action, romance, fantasy. It's great for the whole family. And creating a musical that does what Spamalot did for Monty Python and the Holy Grail is something that I think should be on Broadway right now. I don't think Hercules will adapt that well on stage, and I don't think UHF has a big enough following for it to be successful on Broadway, whereas Princess Bride has great potential for original music and a big enough following for it to be successful. All right, and Eamon, to finish it off. Yes, um, so Louis Dow Yankovic is probably the biggest name in comedy music. And if he were to create, and well, if, I'll let you I'll give you some time to name somebody else. But I think if he were to, if you put his name on the marquee, we, uh, Weird Al Yankovic's UHF, I think you could push a lot of seats. And I think it, it could grow the fan base um, from the musical. And I also believe I would not want to see the source material of Princess Bride mess with to try and. Uh, be parodied, um, be parodies of other shows. So UHF. <laughs> Woo. Wow. Um, any cleanup on that Vaughn? Um, Sarah was correct. Her, uh, her film has the highest, uh, Rotten Tomatoes ratings. UHS have UHF has a 63%. Hercules has an 83% and the princess bride has a 97. And in your opinion, Vaughn, which one do you think should win? Honestly, I really liked I really liked um, your point about if you put Weird Al's name on the marquee, that would really I feel like that would really pull an audience. It didn't work so, with the movie. Why would it work with a Broadway? I guess. Movie? Hey, 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 the argument's over. Ooh. Hey, hey, time is up. Weird Al is time, time, too time is over. Time is over. I just I just hear. will I will say I had you last until that point. I think that Sarah gets first, but between second and third, I'm conflicted. Why well, you guys? I wholeheartedly disagree with Vaughn. Uh, Sarah got bashed in on more arguments than she's ever been, and she didn't defend any of them well. Uh, the Hamilton, I disagree with that. The Hamilton buttering up with Hamilton, I, they hit her on the cash cow cashing in. I think that was a good argument that they made. My opinion, Eamon wins. He had the power of Weird Al. He uh, defended his own, the arguments they made against his better than Sarah did. By a long shot, and Nick, you just had no shot, man. <laughs> oh, they, I know. They, they, got, they beat you in yeah, with the Disney no Cruise way. thing, and it's, un, it's improbable. 
Eamon wins this, in my opinion, without questioning it whatsoever. I think Sarah backed herself up pretty well. Sarah I think so, too. Yeah, like, and here's the thing. Like, I thought about this, too. It's like, which one am I going to buy a ticket to tomorrow? And I'd buy a ticket to Sarah's right away. After the introduction, I was like, I would go see that. Now, that being said, you all had very, very good points. Because I said, like, you guys need to, like, attack her. And you did. You <laughs> all had very good points. Um, like, the cash grab was very good. The Like, you didn't think, like, the rapping and basically being, a, like, it would be kind of a copy of Hamilton. But, I mean, other musicals are going to do it. And That's other musicals have musical done it. Is. But, and like he said, H. would that help, um... Princess Bride at turning the source material into being a parody helped as well. However, I think that the arguments that you had against everyone else's points, including the fact that Weird Al's, yeah, he's, it's a good name, but I mean, he's not like the king of lyric comedy. And I think that Who is? Uh, you could say like Island Richard right Cheese, you could say like mm. other people. Now they didn't. Lonely Island. Lonely yeah. Island, or now I, I'm not say, putting that against you, but the point in being is uh, UHF doesn't have that, that big that you have to look. right the fact that i have to look it means it doesn't have as big as a cult following to drag enough names even if it does have weird al's name on it and that being said it was between you two but i gotta give sarah the first place point with aiming second and nick but that was very very close guys and i mean you just had a good argument too i think the cruise line with that really does because i yeah, I, I actually that it, know it that background like, oh, information <laughs> that they actually do do that with some oh, other yeah. shows they put that in the cruise is just a test now the 30 minute was a great argument but overall i just think they hate you very I think well it was actually an hour long i don't know so I, like, all i gotta say is that when i found out that princess bride was the thing we were going to be arguing against Eamon and i flipped a lid my notes <laughs> say wing it <laughs> there's yeah, nothing I, I could say against I, Princess, Princess Bride. Princess Bride I, is my yeah, roommate's favorite movie. I kind of got that too. She can quote verbatim the whole thing. And when we were like, you know, going back and forth on pitches, and she was actually the one that pitched Epic Rap Battle because she also loves Hamilton. And I was like, oh, that'd be sick. That'd be so. cool It was I just like right even, whether it would have been good or not, your pitch alone just like sold me. See, I'm and the so, opposite. It doesn't matter about the pitch. Princess Bride wins. Yeah, Got that too. <laughs> it's pretty so, but you guys all had really good fights, really good arguments. This was a great round. And I believe Sarah won hands down, right? So, but good job, guys. Um, that was an that was an amazing fight, and um, we hope to have you back sometime in the future. Yeah. Thank you, Vaughn, for facts. Thank you, Morgan, for time and score. Thank you all to the crew. And uh, with that being said, thanks for. I always say thanks for coming, but. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your lives. I like that, actually. So, yeah, enjoy the rest of your lives. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Oh. Like and subscribe. Do that like as well. So Do that. She got you. Below. She got you. Yeah, yeah. leave a Yo, comment down below. Turn on subscription notifications. Yeah. <laughs> Check out YouTube. Bye bye. <laughs> YouTube.com slash Amo Day. All right, that's a wrap. Nice job. All right. I was going to cut it there, but. Right. I'll put it post credits. <laughs> <laughs>